All right, can everyone see that okay? Yep. All right. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Miriam and Athlete Soul, for having me. I am really excited to be a part of this panel specifically. Um, some of the things that I am going to discuss today will be crossing over with the incredible speakers we've already had. Um, so today I'm talking about the Fueled Former Athlete, Transitioning Your Nutrition in Life After Sport. So a quick little bit about me. I was a synchronized swimmer, or now called artistic swimming, for 11 years. I was fortunate enough to have three appointments to the U.S. national team. I ended my career as an Ohio State Buckeye where I competed all four years. And now I am a registered dietitian nutritionist and I am the founder and CEO of Spot A Strong Nutrition LLC, which is a nutrition coaching company focused on helping former athletes learn how to fuel their bodies in life after sport um, and really improve body image, which we're gonna talk about quite a bit today. So we've been talking about athlete identity, and there's a really big connection between athlete identity and body image. When you were competing, your body is what allowed you to compete and achieve. It was your ability to perform. And so often in many sports, it's also connected to, you, to your worth. Um, do you have a body that allows you to score so many points? Is it how you look? Are you in an aesthetic sport? Um, a lot of these things are tied to your, your identity as an athlete and therefore your worth as well. Um, and we identify as athletic, like Katie was talking about, it's a piece of our identity, but when we're competing, it tends to feel like our entire identity. Now this was confirmed in a 2019 study that is published in Nutrients. It was done by some Australian um, researchers. And one of the quotes from there was that individuals who continued to identify as athletes had a poorer relationship with food and body. And I think that's really important and that's a lot of what we're gonna talk about today. So what are some of the statistics? From this study, it was a meta-analysis that looked at a whole bunch of other studies focusing on food and nutrition in the retired athlete community. 42 to 65% of retired athletes engaged in adverse nutrition behaviors. Now, what does that mean? That is binging, restricting, purging. Um, part of the purging would be excessive exercise. 75% of retired gymnasts and swimmers, so more focused on that aesthetic sport, were classified as healthy according to BMI. Um, and I have a whole thing on BMI, but that is for another talk. Basically, they were classified as healthy, yet 55% of them were dissatisfied in their current body and 60% were engaging in weight loss practices. So what happens is we have these unwanted body changes and they tend to trigger compensatory exercise, meal skipping, and subsequent binge eating. So this is a model that I use very often when I'm working with clients or giving talks. The retired athlete gets frustrated with body changes. They decide to restrict what they're eating. It results in binge eating, which is just a physiological response. When we don't give our body adequate energy, our body is gonna go searching in energy because it thinks it's starving. And binge eating is that way to compensate for a lack of adequate energy. Then we binge eat, then we feel guilty and we're frustrated because we're still where we, where we were when we started and the cycle repeats. So why, why does this matter? One of my favorite sayings is how you feel about yourself determines how you fuel yourself. Think about it, have you ever been feeling so great about yourself, you got a promotion at work or, or something was going really well and you're eating all the salads and the fruits and vegetables and you're feeling so great and then you have a really hard emotional day, something happens um, in your life and all you wanna do is go for the comfort foods, the pizza and then that, sorts, that tends to turn into that cycle of not feeling good, that binge restrict cycle. Um, so how you feel about yourself really determines how you choose to fuel yourself. So what I always say is as athletes, we are great at understanding our bodies and we are even better at ignoring them. I know, unfortunately, I was plagued with some injuries during my time as an athlete. Um, looking back, hindsight is 2020, likely because I wasn't feeling myself well. Even though I'm very, I was very aware that I had these injuries, I tended to ignore them. I was like, nope, I'm gonna keep competing. I don't need to focus on them. Um, and we do that so often with our nutrition needs as well. So once we retire, ideally before we retire, but if you find yourself in retirement and you're struggling with this, it's time to tune back in. The first step is identifying hunger and fullness. You might think that that's very easy. Well, yeah, I know when I'm hungry. Well, yeah, I know when I'm full. 
but there are some nuanced pieces that come into play here, um, especially as, as Katie was mentioning in the previous presentation, if you were a football player or you were an athlete that had to gain weight, maybe you're used to eating past fullness so you can put on muscle and weight. If you were an aesthetic athlete, maybe you were used to ignoring hunger cues to try and restrict what you were eating to maintain a certain physique. So it's really important that we take a moment to tune back in. So some common signs of hunger include thinking about food, anticipating the next meal. Something I hear so often from my former athletes is they're thinking about food 24 seven. Food consumes their mind. And to me, that is an immediate trigger to talk about, okay, are you eating enough? Are you balanced throughout the day? Let's take a look at this. Um, some other physiological responses are headache, stomach growling. Oftentimes if we reach the point of our stomach actually growling or feeling empty, it's too late, we've reached hanger. Um, difficulty concentrating or focusing. This is one of my biggest uh, hunger cues is if I start to notice I'm having a hard time focusing, um, it's probably because I need something to eat. Lightheadedness, nausea, and then of course that irritability or that hanger because we have a release of hormones when we get hungry. Our body is saying we need energy and that can really impact our mood. Signs of fullness on the other hand um, may not be as straightforward as my stomach is full. It could be that food tastes less quote unquote good or it becomes less appealing. Have you ever noticed when you are eating a meal, that first bite, those first couple of bites, they're oh so satisfying. They just feel like bursts of flavor in your mouth. Everything just seems so intensified, so delicious, especially if you were coming from a state of being really hungry. And then the more you go into the meal, you just notice that ah, it's just not, it's not as good as it was. You're not feeling quite as satisfied while you're eating it. This can be one of the early signs of fullness. Um, your thoughts of food start to go away. Maybe you were really thinking about food coming into this meal. Again, the physical sign, your stomach feels tight and full. Um, you notice that you're able to start to focus and concentrate more. And again, food becomes less appealing. So I love utilizing the hunger and fullness scale. I think it's a really practical way to start to tune back in and understand what is my body telling me. So breaking this down, one, if you are at a one, you are reaching that famished, irritable, faint, starving, I need food ASAP position. Two is you're very hungry and you need food pretty darn fast. Three, all right, I'm hungry, I'm ready to eat, let's do this. Four is those, be it's those beginning stages of hunger, maybe the difficulty concentrating or you're starting to think about food. Five is complete contentment. You don't feel hungry, you don't feel full, you just feel totally content. Um, that position, maybe you feel a couple hours after a meal before you start to get hungry again. Six is full, but you definitely still have room for some more bites. Seven is that sweet spot, satisfied and fueled comfortably full. Eight is maybe you ate a little bit past fullness. Maybe you're loosening your belt a little bit. Nine is definitely too full, feeling sick. And then 10 for the American listeners is that Thanksgiving status, like that overly full, so stuffed, feeling so sick. You can't even move, you can't even breathe. You just ate way past fullness. So hunger and fullness is really the first thing that you can apply once you retire to tune back in. And this takes time. I always say it is, it takes practice just like anything in our sport. Um, there is no failing when it comes to working this out. It, each and every eating opportunity is an experience to learn more and gather more data. Maybe you have three slices of pizza and you notice that you're at an eight, nine, you know, okay, next time I'm gonna stop at, at two slices. Um, each time you gather more data and it'll make the next eating experience just that much more enjoyable and fueling yourself in a better way. The burn to earn mentality. Now this was a quote that I found really, um, really interesting from the same study from Australia. Retired swimmers reported that when they skipped workouts, they felt the desire to skip meals to compensate. Now, Katie talked about how there's those two extremes when it comes to exercise. Maybe you, you retire and you don't work out at all. Maybe you retire and you go to the other extreme and you're constantly working out. If you have this burn to earn mentality, which is so often associated with our athlete identity, it can impact whether we choose to fuel ourselves well or not. Oops. All right, there we go. So you still need to eat, 
even if you didn't work out. This is so important to recognize. Your body still needs fuel whether or not you do an intense workout. If you're tuned into your hunger and fullness cues, they will adjust. I often get times a lot of questions about how many calories do I need to eat? Um, how many macros do I need to eat? And we can provide you with guesstimations. I have a ton of predictive equations that we can figure out using your height, weight, weight, age, gender, all of that, roughly how many calories you need. The reality is our body needs different amounts of energy each day because we don't always do the same things, especially when we retire. Maybe you have a family, maybe you're running around to soccer practice or whatever it is. Um, you're burning different amounts of energy each day. So when you're tuned into hunger cues, your body will be the best energy calculator and it will tell you how much you need to eat. This is a really big point that I always emphasize with athletes. Your muscles aren't the only thing that use energy. In fact, your brain accounts for 20% of oxygen and therefore calorie usage. I also work in a hospital as a clinical dietitian and I work in a pediatric ICU. And one thing that I share with a lot of my clients is that when I have a patient come in with a traumatic brain injury, the first thing I do is increase their calorie needs and their protein needs because our brain is such a big user of energy. We want to make sure we're feeling that well. So if you're thinking throughout the day, if you're focusing on a project for work, if you're in grad school, um, if you're helping, if you're homeschooling right now in COVID and you're trying to figure out this new way of math that I don't even know how major props to parents because I don't know if I would be able to figure it out. If you are thinking, you should be eating, even if you're not moving very much throughout the day. All right, so now we're talking about the macro breakdown. We're going to start with carbs. Carbs are arguably one of the most controversial macros and the difference between macro and micro. So a macronutrient will provide your body with energy, carbs, proteins, and fats. They will break down and provide your body with energy. Micronutrients like vitamins and minerals, they are extremely important for cellular function, hormone optimization, all of that, but they don't provide your body with energy. So that's the big difference there. So carbs are our body's most ideal source of energy, specifically for our brain and our red, our red blood cells. Um, and we already talked about how our brain needs a lot of energy and a lot of fuel. Red blood cells are what transport oxygen. So in order to keep our body fully circulated and everything, we need adequate carbs to provide energy to those red blood cells. Now I say most ideal source of energy because yes, our bodies are amazing, they can adapt, and we can use other forms of energy to fuel ourselves. That doesn't mean that they're most optimal. That doesn't mean that they're most ideal. Carbs are gonna be your body's most ideal source of energy and they are broken down most efficiently and used most efficiently as well. Protein, on the other hand, is the building blocks of everything. Now, protein is again, arguably one of the most talked about macros when it comes to the athlete and sports world. We're always pushing more protein because we wanna gain more muscle. Um, well, we still need protein when we retire, um, but maybe maybe not quite as much. It does depend. This is where those, those nutrient breakdowns do change when you go from athlete to retired athlete. So protein is the building blocks of our muscles, our hair, our skin, our nails. It's also really important in fluid balance and enzyme production. Now, all that means is it helps with a lot of things happening in the body, a lot of reactions that occur, and fluid balance, um, we want to make sure we're having enough protein so that way we can maintain adequate fluid balance. Protein helps to keep us hydrated, believe it or not. Fat, fat does not make you fat. I always stress that, um, especially if maybe your parents grew up in the fat-free era um, or maybe your coaches did or anything like that. Fat is actually essential for so many things. And we have certain, certain fatty acids that we categorize as essential meaning our body can't make it. Our bodies can make so many things, but they can't make certain fatty acids. Therefore, we need to eat them and consume them so that we get them. Um, it's also really important for vitamin absorption, specifically vitamins A, D, E, and K. Vitamins A and E are really potent antioxidants. They can help support immunity, which is something we all wanna focus on right now. Um, so if you're eating, if you're having vitamins or minerals or anything like that, um, really important, you're having adequate fat intake as well, so you're fully absorbing them. It's also important in cell signaling, um, so for your cells to talk to each other, they actually fire through this thing called a myelin sheath, which is a coating of fat. And so in order to cell signal correctly, we have to eat adequate fat. Hormone optimization, which 
There was an incredible talk about hormones that I heard, and I, I really hope I get the chance to watch it. And this is so important. Um, the first thing when a female athlete comes to me, if we find out that she's not hormonally optimized from retiring, maybe she restricted when she was competing, um, we go to looking at well, how much fat are you taking in? Are you taking in adequate fat to support hormone optimization? Um, and finally, it helps with satiety too. It helps you to feel full, to feel fuller for longer, which is something that we do want to focus on when we're having busy schedules as um, retired athletes. All right, so how can we optimize your meals? You must include all three macronutrients, carbs, fats, and proteins. Fiber is really key for fullness as well. And you can usually kind of do a two for one in your carb if you're having more complex carbs like fruits and veggies, whole grains, they are gonna be high in fiber. Now we're gonna get into more of the satisfaction factor. This is key. Um, when it comes to leaving a meal feeling satisfied. So this is where I come from the approach of an all foods fit mentality. Um, and fullness does not equal satisfaction. We're gonna get into that. So full versus satisfied. These um, definitions are from a colleague of mine, Rachel Hartley. Fullness is the physical feeling of satiety, AKA you ate the right amount of food. Whereas satisfaction is the emotional feeling of satiety, AKA you ate the right things. Have you ever walked away from a meal and you're like, oh, I feel so full. But then five minutes later, you find yourself in the kitchen or in the pantry, opening up the fridge. Like, I just feel like I need something else. I'm full, but I'm just, I'm missing something. That is the satisfaction factor, um, which is really important in helping to prevent overeating. You wanna make sure that when you're building your meals, you're building in a satisfaction factor. Now, maybe that's something like dessert. Maybe dessert is your satisfaction factor. Maybe it's making sure you have adequate carbs on your meal. Um, maybe it's you know something like mac and cheese or mashed potatoes or something that is just really delicious. Now, it doesn't mean that that's the whole meal. You wanna make sure that it's balanced, but you also wanna make sure that you're adding in some satisfaction to help prevent overeating. So we've talked a lot about training life versus life after sport. And I loved in Aaron's presentation talking about, and Katie's as well, talking about training for being an athlete and then training for being just a healthy individual walking around. Um, and those are two very different things. And it, same thing when it comes to nutrition. When you were training, you know, fueling your body, it was your job. You had to make sure that you were fueling adequately to be successful in your sport. Food was needed. Maybe it was needed for body aesthetics. Maybe you needed to gain weight. Um, your time was fully focused and dedicated to training and fueling. I know when I, when I was leaving Ohio State, they were just putting in all of those incredible fueling stations. And so you had access to fully prepared meals. As soon as you were done with practice, you, you had access to all of these things that maybe you don't have access to now when you retire. Um, and the other biggest thing that is really important to note is the sport culture influences. And Katie touched on that a little bit, and so did Erin. Sport culture really does influence how we view food, how we view our body, how we view our relationship with exercise. And so that all plays into it when we're training. Now, in life after sport, our priorities are different. They're more career focused, family focused. Maybe we're building relationships. We've got social lives. Our time is dedicated more to, to living. We don't have the time dedicated to train, to fully focus everything on um, making sure that we're training and eating for a specific goal. Now our goals are different. And now we have societal, cultural influences that are impacting that. So these are important things to remember when you go to pick out your foods that you're eating. If you're looking in the mirror and you're, you're judging how you're looking, um, these are important things to note. I absolutely love this diagram. This is from that article, that study from 2019 that was published in Nutrients. So we talk about it up here. Um, sorry, I have to keep moving my, my faces. There we go. So we have athletic retirement, body composition changes. That happens. That will happen. Um, anticipate that it will happen. And something I, I want to point out here too is that body composition changes are not always a bad thing. Maybe your body was functioning at a certain way to be best at your sport, but what is going to be best for, again, that healthy life after sport? Those two body compositions can be totally different. And so it's important to recognize that 
um, because these body composition changes are some of the most triggering things for former athletes to go into these maladaptive behaviors. So one way is body composition changes occur. We have an increase in body acceptance and we have adaptive behaviors. So we appropriately adapt our behaviors. Or more commonly, we have body composition changes. We have a decrease in body acceptance. We have an increase in maladaptive behaviors. And then this kind of goes, it, it bounces back and forth, either compensatory exercise, restrictive eating, all the way to binge eating, and they kind of bounce back and forth. Maybe we binge eat, then we go back to restrictive. Now we need to compensate with exercise. Um, and this is what happens when our athletic body ideal starts to change to more of a, a societal body ideal. All right, so your body does not determine your greatness. And I think this is really important when we're talking about the athlete identity. In order to be able to fuel yourself well, it's important to separate your body identity, your, your athletic body identity from who you are. Your body does not determine your greatness as an athlete. It is just the vessel that carries it. It's important to fuel it well, move it daily, respect it, and therefore be able to thrive in life after sport. These are the resources if you guys wanted to look at any of those studies for yourself. And it should say thank you in, there we go. Thank you guys so much. Katie, that was uh, fantastic and uh, really inspiring actually. Um, I, you know, I've listened to a lot of the nutrition, presentation on nutrition, but I think that was really good in highlighting uh, the intuition that should go into um, your approach to food. And for me, that really hit home because, you know, I come from France and we have, I think, a little bit of a different relationship with food. Um, and I really liked um, everything that you have said because it hits home on, on the way I was raised with relationship to food. So I thought it was awesome. Um, and I actually thought, you know, you mentioned the fueling station um, in the colleges. And I think these are fantastic tools for athlete but I think the the drawback though is that um, it limits your relationship mm -hmm. with the food it's very easy you get a wide a, a range of things to pick from and you don't have to cook but it it becomes this transaction with mm -hmm. your food um, and I think it's sort of you don't have this build up and this ability to pay attention to your signal whether it's the signal for anger and for, for anger but also what type of food you want. Like, I think that builds up as you go, as you go hungry, hunger, more hungry, right? I um, absolutely agree. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, th thank you so much for, uh, for sharing um, and taking the time to join us. Um, I'm gonna bring Erin um, and Katie back. Uh, we're gonna take uh, questions from the audience if, if anybody um, has anything they want to ask. Um, perfect. Welcome back, ladies. Um, I'm going to start a little bit, I, I think, on something we touched on at a, during one of the previous uh, sessions um, is sort of the, the impact of personal branding as athlete in the role of social media, both from how it impacts nutrition, Katie, but also um, perhaps the difficulty um, with regards to identity and, and moving out of sport. I think it has an impact on um, how you see yourself as an athlete or former athlete. There's a lot of comparison with people that are still in the sport. Um, there might be some uh, relationship aspect that are challenging as well. I mean, I've heard quite a few athletes say that they completely removed themselves from social media when they transitioned because they just couldn't stand to compare themselves to others that were still competing, uh, whether it was from a, a body image perspective, as well as the, all of the achievement or the perceived achievement, right, um, that others were placing on, over the uh, over the internet. So I'm just curious if you if you girls have um, any comment on that aspect and suggestions for athletes on how they can navigate uh, the digital world, basically and um, what impact that has on their perception of, of, of life. Um, any, anybody you want to chime in or stop? Yeah, I can go first. Um, I was just going to say that 
yes, like I, I agree with all of that. It's really hard to, I think, especially like Instagram because it's all, it's very like photo based and video based. Um, and then also as a personal trainer, I actually struggled with that as well. Like becoming a personal trainer, I was like, I feel like as a personal trainer, I should be looking a certain way to get clients and to um, be posting certain types of videos and certain types of things. And it was like just so much pressure. And finally I was like, oh my gosh, like, you know what? I have a lot of clients and they actually like it that I'm like a normal person and that I don't look like um, a bodybuilder. <laughs> um, and so uh, it is kind of like figuring out your brand a little bit, I think in that way, um, which I think just comes with, it, it, I think everyone kind of has to figure that out. But something that's really hit me, I think, especially in COVID and having more time um, is the obsession of having social media and um, the constant, just looking at it constantly really affected me personally negatively. Um, and so I really had to set boundaries on myself of when I checked it. I had to like detox from it because it was, especially right now with everything, it's, there's so much negativity, not even, not even touching on the athletic, looking at other people part, you know, just everything. I, I had to really detox from it and set limits for myself on when I look at social media, just for my own mental health. Um, and I know Miriam, you had taught, told me about a book about, um, you know, digital detoxing and fitting that into your routine. And so I think it fits in with routine as well. Um, when we're trying to figure out a routine for ourselves, um, to also fit in that digital part of it as part of that routine and setting limits so that, you know, you're not like looking at social media and then you're like, Oh my God, two hours just went by. I'm super mad <laughs> and like down just in general. And then it just sets a really negative tone for the rest of the day. So. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, what's interesting is athletes are they're in, in their DNA, they're perfectionists. They want to look the best. They want to do things the best way they can, they can do it. Um, that's what they were. That's how they get the best in their sport. Uh, but I think it has an impact on on how you exercise for health as well. Um, you know, in our sport, we exercise to be the best. But then, when you go into life, will you easily transition into doing all the sport? Not necessarily, because it's very hard to go to a gym and not look the best at bench press or whatever you're doing there. Um, and I think athletes have a real challenge with that. In, in, I think social media and some aspects sort of fuels that is like we have a real difficulty looking vulnerable um, and I think that's just a big aspect and I know Erin you were going like this um, do you have anything to add <laughs> to that the element yeah well Instagram didn't exist when I retired from my collegiate career so I did not get to experience that uh, firsthand but I think for sure um, there's sort of that self-presentation piece that we hear about in, in social media that people are putting on a, a specific front that may or may not match reality. Um, and so for athletes, there is, former athletes, I could see there being an issue around, like you said, confidence um, and that threat to, to looking and feeling confident if you're um, not the best or you're not as fit as you were or you um, are not as fast or strong. Um, but the way I think about social media is using it in a positive way for former athletes to, to connect with each other, right? In ways that we never used to be able to do when you transitioned out, you moved on and, and you were in isolation. Um, now there's these opportunities to build a whole community of former athletes and, and to use that for support and for accountability. Um, so, you know, from an exercise standpoint, having people to check in and and um, hold you accountable in a positive way of, you know, how did that workout go? How are you feeling? Um, did you get your run in today? Um, and so I think that, that I try to, to flip it and think of how can we use it in, in a positive and constructive way to promote a healthy lifestyle, even in spite of the vices that we do with it. Absolutely. And actually, uh, I think Katie Spada, um, your company does a really good job at uh, using social media to connect and, and put out a really positive message, especially when it comes to nutrition. Um, and I, I think that's been, that's been really nice to see. And it, it's, um, I think you keep it really real um, and down to earth. And I think that's been working well, right? Is, is that Thank how you you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think the biggest thing I've found is um, 
athletes see, you know, either former athletes and I just talked with an athlete recently and she said, I don't understand. Like I'm the only one struggling to still look good and all of my teammates look good. And I think it's important to kind of pull the veil back and realize, well, what is going on behind, behind the closed doors? We yeah. see the pictures of abs and the Apple watch pictures burning a thousand calories, which these are grossly inaccurate, by the way, 27% for a Stanford study. Um, but, um, you know, it's important to recognize that we're just seeing the highlight reel and you're not the only one struggling. Um, one thing that I recommend for all of my clients is you don't have to unfollow because sometimes they get nervous. Well, what if I unfollow? They think I don't like them. Maybe just mute accounts that don't make you feel anything less than really awesome, fabulous, uplift you, encouraging. You know, if you look at a picture and it makes you feel bad about yourself, maybe just take a pause, mute that account for a while until you're able to work through your athlete identity and, and build back up your own confidence. Um, so I, I appreciate that. I try and be very real on my account. It's not always sunshine and rainbows. Um, this life after sport thing is difficult, but like Aaron said, it's it's great to be able to build a community and see that and have support out there for it. I love I love that, Katie. Uh, um, I thought it was a great suggestion to use the mute um, instead of unfollowing. Um, Katie Hargrave actually said it in her presentation. Are you putting on a brave face, a brave face, and suffering in silence? I thought that was a really good way to put it because I think a lot of people are doing that um, and especially with athletes right um, you're you're spending quite a lot of time um, di disconnecting with your body signals uh, and pushing through pain and we're now talking today about like how do you reconnect uh, more with your your inner purpose and and all those feelings that brought you pushed out um, as you were developing through your career. Um, it's kind of a really exciting uh, step in the life of, of an individual to transition and moving out of sport because you get to rediscover and, and renew yourself again. Um, so I, I see it as an amazing opportunity and um, it seems that you guys uh, rebounded on that as well. Um, that was great. Um, we, we don't have any additional question for this morning. So um, if there's anything you girls want to add, go for it. Um, otherwise, we'll, we'll close out and um, rejoin in, in 30 minutes. Uh, Aaron? I was just going to say that I wish that um, we were all like in a room together because, <laughs> man, I feel like all of us could just like talk and talk and talk <laughs> with each other about our own experience. Like, I just wish that we could all like have more time because um, this has been such a great summit and um you know hearing other people talk i'm like oh my gosh yes that was so me i wish i you know would have had someone tell me that or like i wish that people would like i would have had a community to be like this is normal what you're going through and like these struggles are normal or even connecting the struggles that i've had in my life that i didn't even like really think about how it was related to my transition from sports like oh my gosh i was like oh wow that was a light bulb <laughs> so anyway i just wanted to to make that comment <laughs> thanks katie Miriam, i just wanted to echo what you said it's kind of ending on a positive note that transitioning out of sport can be liberating right that when katie harry talked about i think in her presentation around you're always in a very structured environment and routine every day and um, in a lot of ways, it's a, a controlled environment um, towards, you know, being the best at your sport, that's necessary. But when you transition out, it opens up new opportunities. And um, we've had some athletes talk about, yeah, it's scary, but it's exciting, right? It's, it's liberating to be able to now choose activities for myself and at my own intensity and what I like to do and what's fun and to not have to push through pain. Um, and so I think, the way I view it is just important to provide athletes with the knowledge and confidence and skills to be able to navigate that newfound economy in a really positive way. Yeah, and I, and I think that's a fantastic message because I look at it where everything that, that I have developed as an athlete, you know, through hard work for many, many years is something I carry with me and I now use to its fullest capacity basically not just for optimal athletic performance. And so, you know, being able and have the maturity as, as you transition to see how you can use that and transition it in other aspects of your life, I think is really, really exciting. Um, so yeah, I agree, it's a fantastic opportunity. 
Um, KG, do you have one last word? Um, yeah, actually going off of both of them, Aaron and Katie, I remember I had someone tell me, you better really cherish these four years as a college athlete because they're the best your life will ever get. Um, and I think that can be really scary for an athlete when they feel like they're leaving the best time of their life. But like they both said, and like you said, Miriam, you know, stepping into retirement can be this really wonderful, exciting time. Um, and I think just going into that with, with an open mind and an open heart and being excited about those opportunities instead of being fearful about maybe leaving behind, because I would argue I'm, I'm living my best life right now. Um, and so it doesn't have to be that you're stepping out and you're going down. You could be stepping into something so amazing. Um, so to not limit yourself to thinking this was the best it'll ever be. Absolutely. And on that note, I mean, you have to, to have the mindset that you're stepping in the best spot to actually leave your best spot. So it's really, you know, really being able to, uh, to switch your mindset and perspective. Um, ladies, thank you. That was, that was fabulous. Thank you so much for taking the time. We're going to close it for this session. We actually resume in a 30 minute at 12 o'clock Pacific. Uh, we have a panel of, of five athletes. I invite you guys to join. Um, we're going to hear what they have to say, sort of their perspective and recommendation on what we should be doing to help athletes and, and what program could be in place. So I invite you to join and uh, I'll see you in 30 minutes. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye, ladies. Thank you.